Good morning, everyone, and happy Alice Day. My name is Nicolette Jones. I'm the children's books reviewer of the Sunday Times, and I'm delighted to welcome you on behalf of the Wonderland that is the Story Museum in Oxford. I'm very sorry that we're not in that magical place. Nevertheless, I'm very pleased to introduce to you from our own rabbit holes, Piers Torday. Hello. And Amy Wilson. Hello. Both of whom are contributors to Return to Wonderland, a collection of 11 stories inspired by Lewis Carroll's Alice. Amy Wilson is the author of four novels for children, A Girl Called Owl, A Faraway Magic, Snow Globe, and Shadows of Winter Spell. She had a background in journalism, is a graduate of Bath Spa's MA in Creative Writing, and lives in Bristol. The sequel to her first book, A Girl Called Owl, will be out in October and is called Owl and the Lost Boy. Piers Torday's award-winning books include his series beginning with The Last Wild, which featured in the animal exhibition at the Story Museum. You may have seen it. He can also be found online reading his way all through The Last Wild on YouTube and on Instagram. His latest children's novel is The Frozen Sea, and his rabbit hole, like mine, is in North London. The other contributions to Return to Wonderland included, just to give you a taster, Pamela, Pamela Butchart's playful updating, Swapna Haddow's impassioned hymn to the importance of librarians, and Lawrence St. John's plea on behalf of bees and all animals. Piers's story we'll hear about a bit more about in a moment. But first of all, I'd like to ask him, Piers, can you tell me your first memory of Alice? Gosh, my, uh, I can't remember exactly when I first read it, but I think the words and images of Alice in Wonderland have been part of my imagination for as long as I've had an imagination. I think there was something so distinctive and unusual about that story and still is about a white rabbit leading you down a hole into a strange topsy-turvy upside down kind of world things you're not meant to eat or things you are meant to drink um, that make you bigger and smaller inanimate objects like playing cards come to life talking animals i mean there's a it's totally illogical and doesn't obviously make any sense. But I think particularly as a young child, of course, it makes a great deal of sense because it's about immediate responses to the world around you and uh, uh, going with your imaginative instincts. If something can be possible, why not? And I think I've always loved it because it captures the sort of playfulness of childhood. The games you make up as a child are echoed in the games of Alice in Wonderland. Why not have a caterpillar smoking a hooker? Why not um, have a mysterious cat with a huge grin that fades in and out like a ghost? Uh, they're not deeply thought or planned uh, creative worlds like we're used to today in fantasy literature. There's something much more elemental. Yes, interesting. We're going to come back to what you've done with that in a minute. Uh, but tell me, Amy, why did uh, Wonderland appeal to you? Um, well, I've had I've had those stories in uh, same as peers, really, in my mind, in my imagination, uh, ever since I could read. I was given a copy for my fifth birthday, which I still have now, um, which I've scribbled in and treated horribly as I did with most books when I was a child um, but I think there's something so vibrant and magical about it as Piers is saying this limitless imagination but also a great sense of things being a bit naughty the characters being a bit rude things being a bit dangerous and I was thinking about it this morning and thinking but it still feels safe somehow safe to adventure safe to go to these wonderful places and to meet all of these characters who say things that you wouldn't expect children's characters perhaps to say. Um, and I think that's because Alice, she, she encounters everything and she deals with everything. And sometimes she's a little bit, well, I wish they wouldn't be quite so cross and why are they 
this, but she encounters everything and deals with everything and just keeps forging ahead and trying and trying. Um, and I think that that's, that's really magical as well, just the fact that she kind of hangs on to herself through all these adventures in all these different sizes and iterations of herself as well. Yes, uh, it, for the time, Alice does seem quite a, a strong heroine, unusual mm. in that sense. And I think uh, part of the lasting appeal is the character of Alice who answers back and who defends herself and who deals with different kinds of peril um, without getting too upset about it. Absolutely. Um, so, yes, do you, are you an admirer of Alice as a character, Piers? Hugely, I think precisely for that reason. Uh, from the very first lines of Alice in Wonderland, when she says, what is, the, what is the point of a book without pictures or conversation? You're immediately, as a young reader, you're with her because that's exactly what every young reader has, has thought when they, when, they, when they encounter books books for the first time. You want life and illustration and, and, and animation. And again, because Alice doesn't follow sort of preset notions of adult logic, she just sort of goes with, in a sense, where the story is, is taking her, which I think is, again, is what children like to do when they're making up mm -hmm. their own imaginative journeys. Um, but also, I think she does get into quite perilous situations. As, as Amy says, you never, it's always quite safe. But, you know, people are being dispatched to have their heads chopped off. And there are, you know, they are quite strained, some of the creatures and all these uh, strange potions and things that she takes and you know no one really wants to be the wrong size for too long um so there's a sort of this i wouldn't say it's nightmarish but the dreamlike state in which alice finds herself is is quite close to a sort of delirious state that again i think a lot of children will you know because children are ill quite a lot of the time with fevers and colds as we know and i think it also kind of um I remember as a reader recognising that, that there was something very uh, sort of outlandish and uh, odd in the world Alice found herself. So, of course, you identify with the fact that she never, she remains cool throughout. Yes. Uh, and do you see the influence, Amy, of reading Lewis Carroll on any of your work? I think so. I think most of my characters are heading into magical worlds of one sort or another, um, and they're not they're not safe, um, but they take with them some courage and some hope and um, sort of battle their way through. I think also that there are some adult characters in my books who are quite acerbic, um, and I really enjoy writing those. And I and I think as a child I enjoyed reading them, reading them and thinking, well, you know, yes, adults can be like that, and it's okay to say actually and, and give your own view back even though you're a child and even though you're small and your voice is small um, and that voice still carries weight it still matters um, and so I think she probably inspires many things that I write um, it's interesting thinking about it now and just quite how much of an inspiration that's probably been in my writing. Um, so tell me both of you um about the characters that you chose to concentrate on in your own, uh, own responses to Wonderland. Uh, Piers, in your story, yours is a kind of origin myth in which several elements of the story come together, but there's one character in particular that seems to be central. Tell us about that. Well, I've always uh, loved the Cheshire Cat in the uh, Alice in Wonderland stories. I think because, as I said, a lot of the characters are hard to explain in Alice in Wonderland, and that's part of their appeal. But the Cheshire Cat, to me, seems particularly mysterious. He kind of appears and disappears. Sometimes there's nothing much more than a smile hanging there. He has these very gnomic utterances um, about not being all there. And, um, and there's something a little bit sinister about his grin. And I suppose slightly harking back to your earlier question to Amy, I think in my own writing often, I, the Alice Wonderland has been an influence on me because I like animals that arrive with the voice. 
yes. just like the way the white rabbit turns up and immediately he says, "Oh dear, I'm I'm late." Um, then you know you know the character you know the fussy, uh, anxious character he is. You don't need to know why, but um, I also love and who doesn't love a good origin story? So it was really an exercise to see whether I could come up with a reason as to why the Cheshire Cat was the way uh, was the way he was. And um, another story of the same period that I love is the Just So story uh, by Rudyard Kipling about the cat, why the, the cat that learned to walk alone, which is really about why cats, is a lovely way of explaining why cats are so, can be so affectionate and yet so maddeningly standoffish as well <laughs> with human beings. And um, I took as my inspiration the fact that Alice Wonderland is full of delightful sort of wordplay and puns and really is also in some ways a kind of love letter to just to the richness of the English language and the and also the madness the madness of the English language also topsy-turvy and so I just came up with this idea that the, the kind of Cheshire cat and the whole Wonderland universe is is born out of a, a sort of scientist's experiments with words in the in the real world. Well, in a way it is, because, of course, what you feel Lewis Carroll has done is invent things out of phrases so that, you know, um, a mock turtle is invented out of mock turtle soup, which it, where the mock applies to the soup, not to the turtle. Exactly. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, and, and it's full of uh, wordplay and games with language and philosophical um, uh, uh, jokes, if you like. Mm. So I think what you've done by concentrating on um, things that we say as the sources is exactly right. You tapped into the sense of wordplay um, as the the motivation behind it all. It's really one long game with words, isn't it? That from you know, exactly which the book and I, I think as a child reading Alice Wonderland books, I think I remember learning a lot about the language and the way and I think a lifelong love of puns and verbal silliness has never really left me coming from those books and I try to use in the story there's lots of phrases of, it's a scientist trying to find out um, trying to understand why we have so many bizarre English phrases like let sleeping dogs lie and the bird in the hand is worth two in the bush and does the tortoise beat the hare but actually all the phrases I used are animals in the book. So Alice meets a puppy from the sleeping dog's lie. There is a, the famous scene with the dodo and all the birds. Um, and of course the mad, the mad, the mad March hare. So they are, it's, it's amazing how many phrases are already kind of touched on in the, it wasn't very hard is what I'm saying, because the book, the original story is already full of so many rich, uh, as you say, phrases and animals. Yes, indeed. Uh, so, Amy, you focused on a different animal. Um, tell us about why and what the appeal was for you. Why this particular character? Well, um, well, I was told, I was asked to be part of it and hugely flattered and honoured. And then I was asked, well, what character would you go for? And the caterpillar just popped in to my head. And I thought, mm, it's a you know, do I, is, that, is that the right idea? And so I sort of spent a couple of days thinking of other characters and other stories and other ways, but he just, there he was in my head. Um, and so that was the one I decided to go with. And then um, I got stuck for a little bit because I, the only story I could see for him was, um, was transformation. And I was a little yes. nervous about that transformation because he's the caterpillar to to everybody you know for all these years he's the caterpillar um and then i was doing the school run with a friend of mine called colin um <laughs> one day and i said colin colin the caterpillar <laughs> and i think that just started my thoughts going and so it's so strange how things come together um and so that came into it as well and then i had the pipe the hooker and the smoke that the caterpillar has, has got around him all the time. And I wondered how I could translate that for my story, what, how I could use that. Um, and that became the caterpillar's magic. Um, essentially, for most of the story, he is fighting becoming a caterpillar. So his chrysalis has, has begun, but he's thrusting it away 
as hard as he can. And so it's become this cloud of magic um, and has absorbed the mushroom that he sits on. So he gives out these bits of magical advice to people. He's um, a kind of agony to... aunt, isn't he? Yeah, you exactly. you turned him into an agony aunt to, to whom people come with their problems. Um, but right. it, I, I thought in the end, the theme of your story was very much uh, be yourself, be who you are, have the courage to go out, you know, face change um, yeah. and uh, have adventures and new kinds of adventures. So um, I, I, I thought it was a rather good story for Pride Week, by the way, um, because <laughs> even, yes. the, even the ra rainbows are rainbow coloured. Um, and it's very much about that. It's a be yourself story. It is very much. I think he needed to get to a place where he was happy to have these new adventures, to be himself, to acknowledge, you know, everything that he was and along the way encouraging other people to see things as, as they want to be. Yes. Um, yeah, with the, with the Queen trying to make the tulips red and they don't want to be red, so he's very much, well, let them be what they want to be. Um, yes. Yeah. Lovely. It was much fun to write. Um, uh, the whole idea of imagining an alternative universe, um, which you've done in your own books, both of you, um, I, I wonder where you start uh, and why you do this. I mean, in this particular case, in this collection, you had Wonderland and an existing story as your source. But if you're doing it out of the blue, um, how do you find another world? Piers? Well, um, I think it is visual for me, at least. Um, C.S. Lewis famously, famously said that the, the Narnia universe and the land which the wardrobe begins with an image in his head of a, a fawn and a lamppost and, and a sledge. And, uh, and often these images come to you and then you think, why have I thought of a fawn and, and, and a lamppost? Why have I thought of a white rabbit and, and a tunnel? Um, and you start to try and work backwards from those images to how you, how you might get there. And funnily enough, once you start doing that, other ideas start to, start to join in and, 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 and hover, in, hover into view. What and was the starting? Sorry, I just wondered what the starting image was for the last while. Did you have a picture in your head? Uh, yeah, I had um, lots of images in my head. Um, what was what? What was one particular image I had in my head? Well, the starting image for the last while is actually an image that doesn't, in the end, doesn't come into the final book, the Wild Beyond. But um, I don't know if you remember um, quite a long time ago now, probably. 15 years ago so there was that tremendous drama of a whale that swam up the up the Thames um, and very sadly died but there were people trying to save it and onlookers and scientists everyone trying to it was quite a big whale I think it was a, a believer whale and and I remember just thinking what if that whale had come with some kind of message for us what if that whale was trying to tell us something and that was really the image I suppose of an animal trying to speak to us that kind of set off the whole idea for the last world. But funnily enough, I didn't use it till the last book. Yes, and you, and, and you started with a, something a bit smaller than a than a whale. I ended up starting <laughs> starting with a cockroach, and that's in a way what I mean is when you have a big image and you start reverse engineering it, suddenly you realize all these other things are there waiting to find their place. And they sort of accrete as you go along. They add to add to the central idea. Yeah. Just because you you ask yourself a series of questions: Why did this happen? Where did this come from? Where are we? What's what's the message? Those sorts of things. I think when you're when you're creating a fantasy world, I think you do have, need to ask yourself what kind of what kind of world am I trying to create? Because in sometimes I think the the uh, Alice in Wonderland is a mixed blessing as an inheritance to a writer. Because on the one hand, what Lewis Carroll says is you can put anything you like in, in a story. You can have uh, playing cards who are soldiers, you can have caterpillars smoking hookers and, and all that kind of stuff. But in a way, because he was one of the first, he could do that. 
you can make it completely illogical. But now I think readers are really used to fancy worlds, whether it's Middle Earth or Narnia or Hogwarts or all the rest of them that have their own integrity as completely uh, uh, built uh, kind of universes that readers really enjoy escaping to. So I do think now, unless you're deliberately trying to create a wonderland of your own, like a mad world, you want to try and find some logic. So when I was, say, creating the world of the last world, it was really thinking about what wildlife might survive a, a pandemic, how they would relate to one another. And in The Lost Edition, which is a fantasy world about stories, I was obviously trying to set in after the Second World War, I was trying to use stories that would be around and mean something to post-war children uh, and that would, would, would excite them as well as readers today. So it's trying to, um, I think you do also need to sometimes step back from the crazy ideas and pictures and try and create a kind of logic. Otherwise, readers, there's a risk that you think, well, this is just one, one mad thing after another. And I've already got that in Alice in Wonderland. So what, what's new? Amy, what do you start with images and then follow things through logically in a similar way? I think, <clears throat> excuse me, I think I start with um, with the person, um, the character. Um, when I was growing up, I escaped to books. So they were my sort of safe place, my world. <coughs> excuse me. And um, it was fantasy books that took me further and showed mm. me more. Um, books by Lewis Carroll, C.S. Lewis, Diana Wynne-Jones. Um, and I loved the idea that magic was possible, that for all the time I was reading that book, these things were real, these places existed, these people are doing these amazing things. And that's my natural, that's where I want to go when I'm writing, that's where I want to be. Um, and so um, my worlds sort of evolve as I'm writing those characters and, and quite often around the emotional journey of the character. Um, so I've got quite a lot of the, the real world um, in most of my stories. And so it's just, for me, it's pushing it just a little further. Uh, what if anger mm, sort of made ice on your skin? What if you could use that to do things with? What if that led you on an adventure? Trying to use the physical sensations of things like shock and goosebumps and like, well, that would be like the ice on yes. your skin. And, and using what is real for me um, and pushing it just a bit further um, so that hopefully it feels a, about as close to real as you can get magic yes. to be. That's very interesting, the way you marry the the uh, real circumstances and fantastical circumstances. You mm. both do that. There's both, uh, there's a, we, that's what makes your imaginary universe plausible, that, uh, that things happen, particularly feelings happen in the way that they might happen in real life in reaction mm. to things. Mm. Yes, that's, um, I think that's true. That's what gives... And, and of course, that's what Alice in Wonderland has, that Alice reacts like a normal girl, um, even though the things that she sees are extremely strange. But it's her, it's her sort of everyday persona that makes, makes you believe that she's in this strange world somehow. Mm -hmm. Yes, very interesting. Um, because it's the 200th anniversary of... Uh, Tenniel's birth. I just wanted to ask you a little bit about your feeling of, about the illustrations. Do you have a particular fondness for Tenniel's? It's been illustrated, this work, by so many people ever since. Um, almost every great illustrator you can think of has had a go at Alice at some point. Um, do you have any favourites that aren't Tenniel, or is everything Tenniel in your head? Piers, do you have? Well, um, I think Tenniel is still the greatest. Um, there's something about those line drawings that I, I think as a child, I did find some of them a little bit scary, particularly not just the Wonderland, but the Alice universe, so things like the Jabberwocky. They are quite scary. And even actually the Cheshire Cat is quite um, sinister, I think, in his illustration. The Cheshire Cat was comes from many places. Um, 
some believe it's from carvings, some stone carvings in a church that Lewis Carroll allegedly uh, uh, visited. And it's interesting, although, as you say, every illustrator has taken has taken the Cheshire Cat on. Famously, there's the Disney version, um, so the bright pink and purple thing. Um, and then there's the Tim Burton, uh, more recent kind of movie version. But they've always retained, I think, the Tennille kind of slightly sinister grin full of fangs and um, uh, gleaming eyes. And so I think the reason he's the greatest is that no one's been able to escape from under his shadow. No one has really reinvented Alice illustrations, the White, the white Rabbit or the, the um, Mad Hatter or the March Hare. No one has really managed to completely escape his, his original yes. visions. Even the things that are very different feel like a reaction to, so that, say, Helen Oxenbury's um, illustrations, which probably are among the least sinister. They, she's managed to make some of those strange things friendlier. Uh, you yeah. feel as though she's doing it because somewhere in the back of your mind there's a sinister version. Well, um, yeah, I think I th it feels conscious, doesn't it? I mean, it feels like it's yeah. an attempt because the, they're not that, because in the text they are quite sinister. I think there's no escaping. Uh, well, for me anyway, there's no there's no escaping. I'm not saying there shouldn't be softer versions of uh, and friendlier versions of Alice. Many versions as you like. It's why it's such a adaptable story. Yes. But uh, I, he 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 captures the magic of Wonderland the most for me. Do you have favourites? Is Tenniel yours, Amy? I think so. I think it just feels like the truth. You can build on it, and you can have different mm -hmm. versions of it. But probably because I encountered that and that was my first experience in the book that my grandparents gave me, um, it feels like that's the real one. And I think it has a mood about it. As Pierce says in the line drawings, the shadows um, and the relief that just feels very much of Alice. Um, my daughter, my youngest, has a big pop-up version, which she absolutely adores. But they're based, again, they're based on his illustrations i believe they're very yes they're uh, that's very robert sabuda's uh, pop-up one possibly um, which is a beautiful work of art very much you she you, you can pull out and fall down the rabbit hole yourself yeah. with your you know it's amazing but i think um i the tenniel is it yeah as i say it just feels like the truth it just feels like that's where alice is it's funny how iconic it became because uh when Carol first wrote it as Alice's Adventures Underground, he illustrated it himself. And what Tenniel did was something really quite unlike. Mm -hmm. And of course, Alice Little, on whom it's based, was a little brown haired girl, which is something a lot of subsequent illustrators have picked up on. Um, but the blonde Alice took hold, partly because of Disney. Um, but th that's because Tenniel, who was an illustrator for Punch, and in some ways, possibly slightly unlikely choice as the illustrator of the children's book. He was somebody who was a political cartoonist, among other things. Mm. Um, uh, it's, it, so it's, it's strange that that now seems to us to be the one that encapsulates what we know. I think one of the interesting things, too, about it is that there are some episodes in uh, Alice in Wonderland that aren't illustrated, and nobody remembers them. Do you remember, for instance, the pigeon in Alice in Wonderland? There's a pigeon that comes down the chimney. Um, I only remember the because I put it in the Cheshire Cat, but I oh, don't. Yes, <laughs> so you did. So but I, you but did. Otherwise, otherwise, you're right, I wouldn't. Yes, I wouldn't you went back and looked closely and found the pigeon again. <laughs> um, I think that's interesting because it's not as well known as, say, the dodo, because we've all seen, we all remember Tenniel's drawing of the dodo. So the, so the images uh, focused our mind on which bits of it we actually recall. It makes me think of uh, the way you use photographs to link to memories. And I think I remember yes. this because I can see my, you know, a photo of myself when I'm six. I think I can remember it because there's the photo, there I am doing it, whether I, and there are other memories, other things that have happened that didn't get photographed that, you know, perhaps I've completely forgotten. Yes, that we need, we need a, an image in our heads, at least one of our own making, but uh, if not, an, an external image in order to focus our own memories and our own thoughts. I think that's and actually, I think, Nicolette, your point about them, him being a punch illustrator is really interesting because, you know, when I was growing up, it was absolutely the majority of 
books I was reading as a child were things like Helen Oxenbury or the Allbergs or, um, you know, kind of wonderful, very familiar, uh, almost kind of cosy il- il- illustrations for children's books. That was uh, the, or the, the, the majority of stuff I was looking at. And I think it's the fact that actually the illustrations are quite adult. You know, they are quite, there's, an, so there's sort of an element of caricature about things like the Queen of Hearts and mm. so and so and so and lots of beaky faces, not many people smiling. Generally, lots of char- characters and children's illustrations tend to be quite inclusive, warm and smiling. And a lot of the characters in Alice in Wonderland look frowning, querulous. Or scary. Or scary, okay. and I think I was drawn and to and a bit scared of it, which I think feels appropriate to the story. And also, of course, children love that slightly, they don't want to be terrified, but they like that slightly vicarious. This is a bit, this is a bit strange. I want to know more. Did you feel that? Did you like being a bit scared by it? Were you a bit scared by it, Amy, when you when you first yes. read it? Yeah. It's very strange. I still, you know, I still read it now, and it's very, it's strange. And who knows what contexts I'm missing, <laughs> what oh. things I'm missing when I'm reading it. But I don't think that matters. I don't think it matters when you're a child either. I think it's just the idea of being on this adventure where literally anything could happen. Um, and it's a book, so you're, as as I said before, you're safe. You can go on this adventure. Anything might happen. Anybody might say anything. Um, but you're safe and your character is dealing with it all. And, um, you know, I think that the fact that it's spooky makes it more exciting. And yes. also a bit closer to some of the things that we're experiencing as, as children as well. You know, like, we all like to think that, you know, everything's good and safe and happy, but it isn't always. Sometimes there are dark periods. Sometimes there are things that we don't quite understand and we live them anyway. We keep We keep living anyway through them and I think that that's what Alice is doing um living through this confusion um and I think that you know that association with her is a comfort you know other people going through these times having these experiences and they're just going to keep going (laughs) she's brave on our behalf yeah she's also puzzled on on our behalf because of course one of the things about the adult world is it's confusing so putting a child into a world that's rather strange um also actually reflects the experience of a child growing up because mm-hmm. some of the time you don't actually know what parents are on about or why they're why adults are doing what they're doing mm-hmm. um so so there isn't such a distance between the strange creatures in wonderland and a child's view of adults as we might think there is um, right. because once we read it as adults we we are not used to the idea of things being so strange we've mm-hmm. forgotten um but uh, but Alice is there being puzzled and brave on our behalf. I am sad to say that uh, I think that's all we can talk about. Uh, but we could we do this happily for days, um, long beyond Alice Day alone. Um, but thank you both so much. It's been really interesting to hear your thoughts about this. I do recommend that both the collection and in particular your two stories, which you will no doubt now be curious about. Um, and... Uh, and indeed the rest of your work, which I hope uh, the people that are watching now will be inspired to go and find. Uh, so thank you both. And thank you to the audience from wherever you are, whatever wonderland you find yourself in. I hope you have a marvellous day. Thank, thank you. you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.